All right, so um, we'll get started. I know that this is after school for everybody, and it's, I don't know where you are, but it is really nasty weather in downtown Halifax. So I'll try and get everybody up and, um, and oriented and then have time for questions. So um, I'll start with uh, a little bit of an introduction. Um, and just tell you what we're going to do today. So my name is Wendy Driscoll and I'm the Social Studies Project Lead here at the Department of Education. I'm on a two-year loan of service from the Halifax Regional Centre for Education. So I've been here for the last two school years working on the citizenship curriculum um, in particular but junior high in general. And um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the course and how we arrived at this point. And I'll give you my contact information. I think most of you have it. I recognize a lot of names from um, emails um, over the last few weeks. So uh, I'm accessible by email and um, I'll give you that information at the end of the presentation. I see a lot of people here and so I have a little survey to get you started. And so I'm going to um, put the survey live. It'll come up on your screen here. And there are three questions, and it's basically for me to uh, see who my audience is. So if you would uh, be so kind as to answer the questions uh, that are on the little survey, it'll populate some graphics for us, and then we'll get to see uh, who's here and what you know or already don't know about, about the course. So if you're just arriving, we're doing a little questionnaire. So All right, so everybody's got an answer for the first question, the second question. And almost everyone's done the third question. <laughs> okay, so uh, summary of the results. Um, we've got uh, several people. We've got 11 people who are uh, fairly sure that they're going to be teaching this course in either English or French immersion or integrate it next year. We've got someone who's a uh, department head or administration and we've also got uh, eight people, so almost uh, um, a half, a little over half of the people here who are interested but they're not sure they're going to be teaching um, the course. And so I put this webinar at this point because I knew that not everybody would have their assignments so people might be curious about it. So I'm glad to see that there's a lot of people here who are just interested. And then there, we're going to repeat a similar one at the end of May when more people have their teaching assignments. And you're welcome to join that one too, although it will be much the same as this one. Um, we've also got... Uh, I wanted to know what kind of grade 9 configuration were in people's schools. So um, the majority of the people here today teach it in kind of a full year. Uh, grade 9 is taught in a full year configuration like the uh, traditional junior high type model. And then obviously there's a number of people here where their grade 9s are either in a 9 to 12 school or a 7 to 12 school or even a P to 12 school where it's taught more like a high school, so one semester or the other. Uh, and some of those semester schools I know also do it every other day for the year, but it's equivalent to one semester. Um, and what do you already know? So we've got a couple people who might be uh, friends with or in uh, the same school as a pilot teacher. We've got a few people who've heard a little bit about it, either from me or from uh, a workshop. And then we've got quite a few people, all you know it's coming. So that's why we're doing this now. So I'll thank you very much for, for doing that. And I just wanted to uh, let you know that the webinars that we're doing are going to be recorded. And they're going to be available um, online for you to look at any time or for your colleagues to look at any time after this. So the idea is that uh, they're there if a teacher gets assigned the course in August or they get assigned the course for November for second semester, all of this information is going to be there for them. So um, we are recording it and that's, I'll let you know so you can tell your friends and colleagues when they might have an opportunity to, um, to participate afterwards. So I'm going to check that out. Go back to our schedule. 
So um, a couple of things about the, the technology that we're using. I don't know if all of you have microphones. If you don't have a microphone, um, that's perfectly okay. You can type questions that you have in the uh, question box or the discussion box and I'll try and get to them. If you have a burning question and I'm kind of right in the middle of something, you can raise your hand by using the icon in the top left corner. And um, I'm going to give you a couple of handouts today that you can download. And the download button is along, along your bottom menu bar. It's just the downward pointing arrow and you can download um, the, the outcomes that I'm going to share with you today as well as the professional learning plan. So before we really get started, I just would like to know if, uh, if anyone has uh, any questions before we really get going. Or any issues, or you have thumbs down somewhere. All right. So um, I think we're good. So I'm going to get started. Here's the agenda for the webinar today. And we're going to start with a little bit of a brief brief a brief background. Um, and Michelle had a question, will it be as comprehensive as the uh, MIGMA Studies 11 course? Um, let me come back to that one, Michelle, because um, let's talk a little bit about the outcomes. It's uh, similar in kind of how we've designed it, um, but not exactly the same style. So let's hang on to that one until we look at some outcomes, and then maybe we can talk about it. Um, a brief background to the to the course um, and how it was designed. I just wanted to sort of let you know how we got here. So in 2015, we were um, asked to create a mandatory course in 21st century citizenship. And the topics that were to be included were meant to be civics, Canadian government, citizenship, personal financial management, volunteerism, media, and digital literacy, and service learning. So it's really quite a big um, ask. And in order to do that, uh, there were a number of stakeholder meetings that were held early on. They had people come from the community, people from elections, Nova Scotia, the couple of the universities, Springtide Collective, a number of classroom teachers. And they looked at, you know, what would a citizenship course look like? What are the kinds of goals that we would like to uh, accomplish by having a citizenship course? And they, they looked at... Um, how it might uh, work within the framework of grade 9 and whether it was time to replace Atlantic Canada in the global community. And so that's where this is, uh, that's where this is going. So this is a course that starting in September will be the grade 9 uh, social studies curriculum. So you will have no longer Atlantic Canada in the global, uh, Atlantic Canada in the global community. Um, in order to do that, first we brought in um, a lead team. So I came in in um, 2016 in the summertime and in the fall we had teachers from uh, a number of schools that are here and uh, they came in for several weeks during the fall uh, and then um, we also had joining us staff from Mi'kmaq Services, African Canadian Services and French Programs and Services and together we took this idea <laughs> and put it into uh, a set of curriculum outcomes that we could really start to work with. Um, the, uh, the next step was uh, to give it a try. And so, um, skip ahead. so we put together a pilot team. And the pilot team right now, these are the people or these are the schools right now in Nova Scotia that are participating in the pilot. So the pilot, uh, the teachers in the pilot program have met over the past year. Uh, they met in the summer, they met several times in person, they've met several times virtually, and we've gotten feedback from them and from their students. And uh, from that feedback, we made some changes to the outcomes, and we're ready now to put them into power school. So, the um, in school has them, and uh, they will be in power school before. Uh, well, when when the new year comes on in August, what you'll see is you'll see these outcomes instead of the uh, any of the outcomes for Atlantic Canada and global community, and that goes both for English and for French immersion. 
Um, so we had a number of schools who assisted us with that and I spent a lot of time traveling to those schools and finding out how things were going and, uh, and really by all accounts things were going really, really well. And so we're very, very excited about, uh, about the course. We had uh, some, some other people um, join us in the pilot. We had a school from the MK board, the Mi'kmaq and Matinway School Board. We had one of our international schools in Abu Dhabi pilot for us. And then um, two uh, schools in Se Asape um, also piloted the course in the francophone context. Uh, and so we've had a lot of input uh, from a variety of people uh, in English and French, in French immersion, um, on how the course is working with their students. So it's, it was pretty comprehensive and uh, it's pretty exciting. Um, when we were gathering to get the course organized, we, we used this as our definition of citizenship education. And this comes from UNESCO. And um, we looked at this definition for citizenship education, um, and, and that became kind of the basis. In addition to the direction that we had, this kind of became the basis for uh, what sorts of outcomes we were going to look at, and what kinds of themes we were going to look at. So the idea is that citizenship education is educating children from early childhood to become clear thinking and enlightened citizens. And this last part, who participate in decisions concerning society, that became part of um, a lot of the design work that we did. So. Um, so some of the highlights of the course is that it's, um, it's inquiry-based. Uh, there's some blended learning and e-learning components that go along with the course. There's uh, a lot of cross-curricular opportunities. Uh, there's service learning um, that goes into it. And um, it's, we really look at it as kind of a, a comprehensive um, look at the participation of a citizen, not only uh, in the future when you get to vote, but what can you do now, even though you're 14 years old. So that's sort of the fundamental pieces that we, that we worked with. Before I get into the um, outcomes, and I'm going to uh, share with you a document that you can download, uh, we just wanted to clarify uh, our working, I guess, thoughts around citizenship and civics. So, there's a lot of uh, people who were referring to the course as the new civics course, and um, that's very understandable because the, the civics is the study of the rights and duties of citizenship and how government works. Um, and citizenship itself is uh, a broader scope, and but civics is a really important part of that. So it's integral to citizenship education, but while civics relates to the civic knowledge, like the structure and the um, the process of government. Um, citizenship uh, expands to the kinds of skills that you would need uh, and the attitudes and the knowledge that you would need to engage responsibility in your community, both now and, and as you grow. So um, we look at citizenship as that kind of um, suite of skills and knowledge that students would need to be active and engaged citizens. So, um, I'm going to go and show you the outcomes and the indicators now, but before I do, um, are there any questions that come from this part of how we got here uh, to this point today? So if you have any questions, you can yell them out if you have a microphone, you can raise your hand, or you can actually type them out in the little discussion forum. And if you don't have any questions, that's okay too. All right, I guess we're good. So I'm going to share this um, this document with you, and you can download this. Like I said, it's you're welcome to use it now. This is um, the public document now. Uh, so there's a little arrow down at the in the bottom left that uh, you should be able to download it. I'll uh, I will email it to you. I wrote down all the people who are here, so I will email it to you as well, um, and. This is the, these are the, the outcomes. So I'm going to walk you through them and kind of talk about the themes that they um, correspond to and, uh, and then um, and maybe sort of how they might work. So the first outcome there uh, is 
on engaged citizenship. And this is a service learning outcome. So uh, in this outcome, the students in your class would work together to design um, a project that addresses a need in their school or in their community. Um, the idea of service learning, and some of you might be familiar with the term service learning from other courses, that uh, service learning is a way of meeting outcomes while doing real life activities. <laughs> so uh, it's a little bit different um, than the kind of service learning that they might do in the O2 program, if you're familiar with that, because this is a collaborative service learning um, project. So it would either be your whole class, or if you have a large class, maybe a couple of groups in the class, it's not meant to be an individual. It's meant to look at who, what skills do we have as a group, uh, what are the needs that we see in our school or our community that using our skill set we're capable of advocating for change or for changing, um, what is our end goal and how are we going to get there. So the service learning project, we positioned it here as number one, but uh, just so that you didn't lose track of it, but um, it's not that it has to be the first one or the last one in the order of the outcomes. In fact, most of the pilot teachers this year found that uh, it naturally unfolded the kinds of things as they started to do the other outcomes. The service learning one sort of naturally unfolded in terms of what they thought, uh, what the students thought they you know, might get excited about um, doing in terms of, of helping or ch making changes. Um, the uh, there's the planning and implementing of a service learning project and then a part of that is the reflection on whether or not the um, service learning project has been successful. Not so much as in the end result, you know, did you, you know, build what you were going to build, but um, have you learned about your skills as a citizen, have you worked together, um, all of those skills that kind of go along. So that's really what this one is about. And I think as we look through the other ones, you'll see um, how some of them could really naturally fit with that one. And I have, um, at the end, I am going to give you a little bit of an example of a couple of the service learning projects that we did, that the teachers did this year. I know that um, Amy Jo is asking a question, if there's a budget, uh, to help students succeed with their service learning project. And there is not a budget that goes with this outcome. So um, there are a number of ways that you can do it that don't necessarily have to cost you money. And um, I know a lot of people think service learning project, they think we're going to build something, we're going to make a garden, we're going to, um, you know, something like, you know, something like that, and we're going to need money for that. Um, it doesn't have to be something like that. It can be an advocacy project. So I know that in some places uh, they might see a need that they want to have um, a day of caring for or a day of celebration of, or they want to organize a special assembly or a letter writing campaign. They might want to um, make a public service announcement using their iPhones and broadcasting it on the school lobby television. So it, it doesn't have to be, I know that sometimes we think about that, but it doesn't have to be like that. So um, there are also um, some schools that did kind of like a fundraising thing first and then used that money to buy something that they needed for their service learning project. So they kind of did it in two steps. They saw that they had some skills, but they needed to get some capital first. Um, so I hope that answers your question. And I'll, t I'll t tell you about a couple of the ones that the teachers did. There's a few in particular this year that we're really um, pretty excited about. Um, but let me just sort of go on with some of the other ones, and we'll see how they might fit in. Um, there's uh, this section, these two outcomes, who am I as a citizen? Most of the pilot teachers started with this first. So looking at uh, concepts and attributes of citizenship as members of different kinds of communities. So one of the things that we're really trying to stress with young people is that you are a citizen now and the contributions that you have are important now. And just because you're not 18 and you can't vote doesn't mean that you can't make a difference. And in fact, um, you know, most of the research that we did shows that uh, students, um, by the time they're about 14 years old, uh, already have a, 
a political culture, and they might not identify it as that, but what, what we mean is that they already know the things that they find fair, the things that they find just or unjust. There's things that they get really excited about or passionate about. Um, and so kind of tapping into that and then connecting it to the rights and responsibilities of the voting citizen as they get older. So we start with who am I as a citizen, the kind of rights and responsibilities that people have, the strengths and that the student might have and how that might contribute to their community, um, how their role might change over time. And we look at the uh, changes that have come in the rights of traditionally disempowered people, for example, Mi'kmaq people, women, immigrants, um, looking at the importance of um, treaties as integral to citizenship rights and responsibilities and why certain things have changed at certain times. So that whole section, most of the pilot teachers started with that first because it kind of formed a really, really nice introduction. Having said that, there's no order that you have to do these outcomes. So while most of the pilot teachers started with that, and I, I would think if I were teaching this, um, I would probably start with those ones as well. The rest of them really can be done in any order. I know if there was a federal election, for example, in the fall, I'd probably skip right to the governance. Uh, if there was something going on in my community that was, you know, international in nature, or there was something that happened in the world, I might skip to the making list of outcomes. There's a, a financial, I don't have to be done in order. Uh, we numbered them because the, you sort of have to number things when you're, when you're making a list of outcomes. There's a, a financial uh, citizenship. There's two outcomes to do with financial citizenship. And uh, we were really looking at this as that whole picture of financial capability. So um, what are the economic decisions that governments make, that people make in wider society that might affect me, that might affect different groups of people in different ways? You know, what is my tax money used for? How does the government get to decide what they're going to spend their money on? I think you know this is important, and they think that's important. Um, how come there's so much disparity between different groups of people in society? Um, what's the difference between fairness and equality when it comes to um, when it comes to economic um, decision making? And the purposes or, or the, the people's ideas of needs and wants and money and value. So those are the um, sort of the broad financial ones. And Michelle says she can't see this outcome right now. So I'm going to try and can you see it now, Michelle? Yeah, we are just on page one. I'm going to go to page two. And here's page two. Um, and this is the second uh, outcome that has to do with um, financial citizenship or financial capability. And that is the more personal one. So um, how do the different um, participation and um, decision making uh, at the personal level, how, do, how does that affect uh, the kinds of things that um, are, are more personal for me as a student, so my goals, my financial goals, uh, what are my, um, what are financial management practices that, that might affect the kinds of things that I can participate in, um, what are the impacts of financial choices that I make, what are impacts of financial choices that other people in my community make, so we might look at things like, you know, what happens when um, a lot of young people um, leave a community to, um, you know, to go get work somewhere else. So those kinds of, of economic pieces that, uh, that, that students might be talking about. And so those are the, um, so we've got the, the broader economic, uh, the broader economic outcome and then the more personal financial one. The, um, I'm scrolling up and down for the people who can't see it. I, I'm hoping you can see I just finished number five. Okay. Uh, this number, the sixth and seventh outcome are on digital citizenship. And um, digital citizenship, again, we kind of divided it into the broad and the narrow. So we're looking at um, uh, various media and so how choices are affected by media, how people react and the actions that they take 
uh, based on things in larger media, so social media, mainstream media, you know, pictures. Um, why is it that certain things get um, the public interest in the media and other things don't? Uh, why is it that some groups seem to have more attention in the media and others don't? Um, and what does that do to our perspective as citizens? So when I see something over and over again in the media, how might that affect the choices or the reactions that I make? Uh, the second one is, again, similar to how we did the financial, the broad, and then the narrow. The second one is more on, you know, me as a digital citizen. So what are the rights and the responsibilities and the risks that I take as a digital citizen? And what, um, what is my responsibility for uh, monitoring my own digital footprint? How does that affect the perception of other people? Um, and we talked also about, um, you know, how do we, uh, you know, what happens when we're digitally engaged and what happens when the people that we are digitally engaged with are all similar in thought to us and sort of relating that to the one above about perspective. So the, there's a lot of crossover here for English language arts for sure, also healthy living. So I can see a lot of potential with this one or these two to really connect with some of the other people in your building or if you happen to be teaching those courses um, as part of your um, assignment to be able to do some things where students do inquiry for both subjects at the same time. Um, there are three outcomes to do with governance, and this is the civics piece, so the more the, the, the part that people most associate with a citizenship course. And we're looking at the first one about issues and how they get valued across um, government. So looking at the role of worldview, um, looking at the perception of Canadian identity, and then looking at political parties and looking at their platforms and seeing how um, what can we tell about a party by looking at their the things that they stand for? So that first introduction to um, to political parties, to um, right and left, those kinds of things would would occur here. Uh, and thinking about why certain you know something that I, I might be passionate about or I might think is an important issue, you know, where does that sit uh, in in larger society or, or in terms of politics? The there's two more with um, with, uh, with governance. The the next one, number nine. This is the real uh, meat and potatoes. I was calling it. Um, this is the structure, operation, and selection of government in Canada. So we look at federal, provincial, territorial, indigenous, municipal government models. Uh, how are they formed? Are there elections? Is it done some other way? How are, decision made? How are decisions made? Is it majority rules? Is it consensus? Why is it when you go to um, your poll in your federal election, you don't see Justin Trudeau's name on your ballot unless you live in Montreal? So, you know, all of the things that we would have done in uh, a more traditional um, civic or history type curriculum, this is where you would find the content of that, but you'll see that it's a real investigation. So we're looking at investigating how the different types of um, governments are formed in Canada and that interaction. So not so much listing them or defining them, but really investigating them and making some, um, making some uh, interesting analysis of them. The last one is that last piece of how to meaningful engage, meaningfully engage as citizens within a democratic process. So how do we work? What are the things that uh, people do to make a difference in government? What are things that people do to make a difference outside of government? How can individuals um, advocate for change or awareness or what kinds of actions can they take? What is the role of protest? What is the role of resistance? Um, and how is it that um, some people don't seem to have the same access to democracy as everybody else and what makes certain voices more powerful than others? So that's that last one. So you can see there's kind of a flow to those three. Um, some of the pilot teachers did them in a row like that and some of them did them all together. So they took particular 
same shoes or they did um, a model parliament and they looked at all of those together by forming political parties by I know there was one teacher who uh, her class actually in small groups formed their own um, nations or colonies of a nation I think and they had to decide what kind of government they were going to form and what the things were that were important to them and so you know you could I could really see doing something um, with all of those together in this one. And the final one is on a global citizenship and this is very broad. We didn't define any particular global any particular global issues. We just um, suggested that students could look at the consequences of action and inaction. Um, and so look at a global citizen a global issue. It could be an issue that the teacher chooses. It could be a whole bunch. I know one class um, each student did a different issue and they presented uh, in another class they really got um, sunk into human rights and that became the issue that they looked at from a whole lot of um, lenses uh, in their class um, and looking at Canada's response to selective global issues. So what you'll see is that um, any of those little groups of outcomes could be done in really almost any order. There's a lot of crossover, so if you're thinking about um, who am I as a citizen at the beginning <clears throat> and thinking about global citizenship at the same time, like how do I react, what do I care about, um, are the values that Canada is sort of showing that they, things that, that, that we seem to value are those the things that I value or those things that are valued by the place in the world. So there's a lot of crossover. The other thing that um, you'll see is that we don't name a whole lot of content. So we don't name the political parties, for example. Um, we don't name the type of electoral process. Um, and that's really because we don't want to, A, we don't want to date the outcome. Um, and, and we found a lot of times when you, when you get that specific, it becomes out of date when something changes in Canada or the world. And we really, the other real thing behind it was that we wanted the teachers to have some choice. So you know who's in front of you. You know who your students are. You know what's going to get them um, interested. If, they're, if, you know, if you spend a whole lot of time with Global and not a whole lot of time with one of the other ones because that's where they are, you know, bring those other things into it. So talk about Global Citizenship, but bring the digital citizenship outcomes into that discussion by looking at how social media is dealing with a particular issue. So the whole idea is that you have um, the professional ability to uh, pull in the things that uh, mean the most to the kids in front of you that address their needs and that are responsive to the culture of the class. So that's, in a nutshell, <laughs> what the outcomes and indicators look like. I do have some information on the resources because um, you can't, you know, some people will take this and they would just run with it and some people are going to want a lot of resources and we do have a lot of resources. But um, before I get into that, I just wanted to know if there are any questions on the outcomes and indicators themselves. I'm going to just quickly go back to my PowerPoint. <clears throat> I told you a little bit about service learning. Um, and service learning, uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about one of the projects that happened in our um, pilot program this year. So one of the teachers, uh, one of the pilot teachers had been on the Vimy uh, 100 trip last year with her grade 12s and they had a Vimy oak tree that they wanted to plant and um, they ordered it but they uh, didn't arrive in time for them to do that before grade 12 was done and so she had this tree in the fall and she asked the grade 9 class if they would help her plant it just kind of as a legacy thing they shouldn't really think anything of it and down they went to where the cenotaph is in their town so it's a very small village in uh, Nova Scotia. So they went down there and all they were going to do was plant the tree. And the kids started looking around and they were realizing that, okay, if someone wanted to come visit this tree, um, there's no place to sit down. 
and the cenotaph had a lot of moss on it and kind of looking shabby and there were um, you know the, the grass hadn't been mowed and and so they started asking her questions like who looks after this property and you know why why is it in such bad condition and so she said, well, I don't know, let's find out. And so they, they wrote to their municipal councillor and they wrote to the Legion to find out, you know, who was the steward of the property. And from that, built this whole service learning project. And in the end, what they ended up doing was they got permission from their councillor to, um, to do some work on the land, so they did some raking, they took the flagpole down, they painted it, they wrote to the Legion to see if they could get a new flag because there was no flag. The Legion in their town had closed. All the veterans had passed on. And so they, but they wrote to the Legion and said, well, we still need a flag. Um, and so that became their service learning project. And through it, they, they met outcomes for ELA, for tech ed. They built a bench. Um, they painted the backdrop of the bench. And so they had the art teacher involved. They met their citizen, some citizenship outcomes and they even met some math and science outcomes because they had to do some uh, work about planting because they planted some flowers and they didn't know about the soil and so forth. So um, I just wanted to give you that example that it's about the change and not the charity and it's all about how the citizenship skills are developed. Um, I had a couple questions here. So. Yeah, so are there any digital resources? That's a great question, Therese, and I'm just about to get to that. And few some of the concepts from Law 12 with the political comes. I agree, James. Yeah, there's some definite things if you teach in the high school to kind of, that you can kind of look forward to in terms of, of making connections. I put this slide here, and this might speak to Therese's question about um, digital resources. So yes, there are digital resources. So the first thing to show you is that um, this book, uh, called Engaged Citizenship Canadian Investigations. We have ordered this book for you and that is the Nova Scotia version. It is in English and it is in French. Those are already ordered. I already have them in storage and you're going to get them in your schools before the end of this school year so you'll be able to see them. The great thing about this book is that it comes with um, an online subscription to an e-book and so um, when I do the resource roadmap, which is one of my other webinars, I'll take you on a tour of what that um, online resource looks like. But what I've been just saying to people is that the book is thin and the website is thick. So you've got this book to prompt some questions, there's lots of big ideas in there, but then you've got this website that's got case studies, videos, um, political cartoons, first person uh, accounts of situations, and that we can, they can update, the publisher can update, and that is also in French. And the, it didn't exist in French until this year, but we commissioned them to create a French, um, a French version, um, but from scratch, so it's not a translation of the English, and our French pilot teachers, our French immersion pilot teachers, and our French consultant had a hand in determining the language level of that, as well as the kinds of sources that we use. So that's sort of one of the big resources that you'll get. You will have, uh, you don't get a, there's, it's not a one-to-one -one book, so um, I think you'll probably get about 20 per teacher that you would just keep in your classroom and use when you needed them. Um, but they're the kind of book you'll see when, and when it gets there. It's not a whole lot, it's not, not really text super text heavy, so it's not the kind of thing that a student would need to take home and read to study for a test or things like that. There's a lot of visuals and kind of discussion questions that would then prompt the investigation online. The online piece though, um, we bought enough uh, license for one uh, for every student for logging in, so they can access that. Um, individually. So that's a really good thing to be able to um, do some work in that. The, um, so that's one of the resources that, that you'll get. Um, and that is coming um, probably, well, like I said, towards the end. I'm trying, I was trying to wait as far as I could into sort of teaching assignments as much as, I, as, much as possible. The, um, another book that uh, you'll get in your school is this one called uh, Complete Guide to Service Learning, and that is uh, just a book of all kinds of service learning ideas. So you're getting, in terms of physical resources, you're getting this engaged citizenship book, you're getting the service learning book, and you're going to get, um, and I think the service learning book is 
at least one per school. Um, if enough, I have a little bit of money left over, I'll order one for, for teacher. And then um, the, uh, the other book that uh, you'll get a classroom library of a series called Writing Canada's Wrong. And I've got some other books that we've ordered that you'll get one or two of, like you'll get one or two of, like to keep in, on a shelf in your classroom to use for resource purposes. We've also created, through the Nova Scotia Virtual School, we've actually created here some online um, interactive resources, uh, particularly to do with the digital citizenship and the financial citizenship, because those citizenship outcomes were not covered in the book. The book already existed, so we didn't write this one. Um, they edited it for Nova Scotia, but we didn't add anything to it. What we did was we added some information in the online piece. So all of you will have access to a Moodle or a Nova Scotia Virtual School account, um, and I'll enroll you automatically, um, or you can self-enroll when it's ready. The pilot teachers used it this year and with their students, and that's, like I said, that's where there's some really neat um, interactive activities um, to do with digital and financial. There's also a number of other things, that, uh, groups that we've partnered with or, or sort of worked with over the year. Elections Canada has a number of resources that are in English and French that we piloted for them. They were changing them anyway, so we worked with them to make those better. Um, talk to your kids about money. That's uh, from the Canadian Federation of Economic Education. And they do uh, something called a money fair, which is a really cool activity. Uh, as well, they have um, a book that is in English and French, and I have a link to it, um, called Money and Youth. My Blueprint, I don't know if anyone's used my Blueprint yet, but my Blueprint is the new um, digital student portfolio program that the province um, purchased. And there's some really neat financial pieces in there, and also places for students to identify their skills. And of course, things like SEED, Junior Achievement, um, those kinds of organizations, student vote, the ones that you're probably familiar with using in at the grade line, nine level anyway. Um, just looking at a couple of other questions. Uh, can, Matthew asks, can we get a link to look through before the next webinar? Um, when I'm getting ready for the resource um, roadmap webinar, I'll send out an early link. I do, I prob, it probably won't be for a couple of weeks, but I'll send an early link for sure. Uh, is there going to be class sets of books for 20? No, no, just 20. So um, the class cap is 30, yep, and some people have 32. So the whole idea, Danielle, is that it's not really meant to be a one-to-one -one book. It's not the kind, it's the kind of book where you might, um, you know, share and look at a picture. You might have a couple of students working together. The idea was never, it was not, it's not really a traditional textbook. It's more of a resource book. Um, Amy Jo, yeah, the Complete Guide to Service Learning is only available in English, but I'm sending it to the French version teachers anyway. It's really a teacher book. It's not a student book, so it's really for you. And Colin, it's in French as well, not a translation, but written from scratch at the appropriate language level. The um, the book, uh, Engaged Citizenship, was already translated, already written for Newfoundland for French Immersion when we bought it, so we did not change the language in that book. Um, we found with our French, our early French Immersion teachers that the language level was okay, but with the integrated French that the language level in the book was a little bit challenging, need a little bit more teacher support. The website, um, that goes with the book was created from scratch in French. It was not translated from anything. So they actually sourced French articles, French videos, French newspaper things, and that all came here to, to me, and I shared it with the French consultant, Joni, uh, here at the department, and the t we had a couple French immersion teachers who were piloting it, and they got to see early drafts of what it looked like, and they could say, yeah, this is too hard, or no, this is good. Or So you'll f I think what you'll find, um, Colin and other French immersion teachers, is that the, the digital piece that goes with the book in French is probably very exciting compared to the kinds of secondhand translations you may have uh, either gotten from other places or, or in many cases I know had to do yourself. So uh, we're really, it was a real important priority for me as a parent of a French immersion student that the, <laughs> that the resources be equitable in English and French. So you are going to get things for your classroom library if you're a French immersion teacher, you're going to get things if you're an English teacher. Um, 
Some of them are going to be identical and, and just in the different languages. Some of them are not, but they're going to be comparable. So if we found a, um, if we found a, uh, a little library of books and it was only available in English, we ordered you a subscription to something different in French that was equally valuable. Um, yeah, and Therese is commenting on the Elections Canada stuff. I know it was really um, dated, and I'm actually, they actually spent a lot of time and energy. They called in folks from across Canada, so the, the me from every province went to Elections Canada, and we worked on some new resources, and they are much more interactive. They are much more inquiry-based. Um, they sent us the prototypes and the pilot teachers in Nova Scotia tested them and I went around and tested some of them and they're, they're much, much better. It, you're right, they were kind of dated and old and academic. So I'm really excited about being able to work with some of these other organizations. As soon as I told them that we were doing a pilot program, same with Talk With Your Kids About Money um, and, uh, and Seed, like as soon as they found out we were doing a pilot, they they wanted in, they said, well, here, try this, and so it's really great. Um, Michelle had trouble downloading. You know what, Michelle, um, I'm going to email all that to you guys anyways. You may have to download it as you see each page, um, so I could go back and do that, but I can definitely, um, definitely send you some, because uh, um, I have, I think I wrote everybody's name down. So, um, so I just wanted to, um, I'm really excited about the course. I hope that someday I get to teach it. Uh, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to think it works on pa uh, uh, in person as well as it looks on paper. Um, and um, I just wanted to tell you about the upcoming webinars. So, uh, and, and how the, I know we're running out of, of time a little bit, but um, the upcoming webinars, um, please join me or they're going to be, um, recorded and I have a YouTube channel and I can send you the link for that once all those um, once this one's done it'll take about a week or two for this one to get edited and put there but um, you can join me again May 30th it'll be very similar to this one um, and then in June I'm going to do a resource roadmap and I'm going to do uh, one specifically on service learning and I'm bringing in a pilot teacher to do some of those with me and then assessment and evaluation so how do you really evaluate something that has such broad parameters um, I don't know if I um, if I answered directly or indirectly the early question about comparing it to Mi'kmaq Studies 11. What do you think about that now that we've gone through that? Um, who was asking me that question? Michelle was asking me that question. I don't know what you think now, Michelle. <coughs> While she's deciding if it's good or not. <laughs> um, I do have a professional learning plan, and I just wanted to quickly tell you how that is these voluntary and free webinars. You can log on live or you can um, see them later. The teachers who are doing the pilot, they're putting together some um, uh, collections of media, so photographs, scanned rubrics, uh, videos of their students, and we're putting them together in little vignettes with a voiceover. So it might be somebody talking about how they did the financial citizenship unit and the projects, so, you know, some of the projects their students did and they're, we're doing them with the teachers and with the students so you'll have these kind of little tiny chapters or vignettes um, uh, coming onto the, the uh, Nova Scotia virtual site. Um, so those will be there probably by June, July. We're working on those now with those teachers but they're teachers like you so they only have so much time to spend on that. Um, there's going to be um, uh, so, so we're not pulling everybody out like we used to and bringing everybody together for a whole day of <coughs> PowerPoints. Um, we found that, that the pilot teachers told us that that was really not effective. They did not find that it was a real effective use of their time. And given the substitute shortage in a lot of our regions, we really thought that it wasn't going to work. So the combination of the webinars and then giving you a day. So everybody who's going to teach this next year can take a day. And you can use it however you want. So you can um, work on uh, work in a small group. So let's say there's two or three of you out of school, or even five or six or eight of you out of school who are going to be teaching Citizenship 9. Maybe you watch some of the webinars in the morning, and then you talk about how that might work in your school 
um, or your school community in the afternoon. Maybe you call me or we Google Hangout. Maybe we, um, maybe Joni, who's a French consultant, goes to a certain area and some of the French immersion teachers come and meet with her. She goes to a school and you look at the resources that are available in French or talk about how the language level might work for your learners. You could um, uh, go visit a pilot teacher and then see how things went with them if a group of you want to get together and a pilot teacher came to you. The idea is we, we're, we're leaving it up to your own professional um, choice. You guys know what's going to work best for you with the people that you work with. Um, and so I, I want you to do what you need and call me for whatever part of that I can be helpful with. So you could work on something and say, Wendy, we want you to call us at 11 or we want to do Google Hangout with you. And I can do that. I can physically come or virtually come. But the purpose is to get ready, to share your ideas, to explore the resources. Um, we can do it in May and June. We can also do it in the fall. Um, <clears throat> I would jump on it now if I were you, just sort of getting ready, but you may not know what you're teaching next year and that's okay. So um, just to, to let you know, we're going to do that with a Google form. So if any of you have done other uh, similar, I think the IEIE PD was like this, that you would go to a Google form, you would say what region you're from, and then I would communicate that with your human resources at your region, and that way they know what the sub day is for. Uh, and then they'll bill us. and. We know that you were going to take a sub day on whatever day, and um, yeah, that, that, and that's how we'll do that. that. So I'm, I'm really excited about it. You, you're, it's totally self-directed. You just have to register the days with me. Uh, and then there's going to be a live delivery, I think, in the summer. I'm going to uh, do a little um, camp, and uh, we'll do it with the English and French. My French partner will do it with me, and we'll... Um, look at, you know, a little bit more in depth at the, uh, the resources and look at technology integration and maybe a little bit more in depth at, at assessment. So, um, okay, so Michelle asked, uh, the resources are comprehensive for the MK course. Will they be for this one? I think you'll find them quite comprehensive. I'm really, I think that there's a, there's just so many things that we're going to have available to you. They're not all in one book. But I think that that's the beauty of it, is that you can um, pull in the things from different sources that you, uh, that you want. Um, yeah, I'm going to email those to you, Therese. And, okay, my, Matthew's going to share it with you. Done. Okay, you guys are amazing. The other thing that you're getting is you're getting Chromebooks. So because we're putting so much digital, um, I guess, focus uh, on some of the, the, the resources, so, um, you will be getting Chromebooks. The French immersion teachers have probably already. Um, you will be getting Chromebooks. The French immersion teachers have probably already got them. I sent the immersion teachers have probably already got them. I sent those out early because I ordered them separately with French keyboards. So, if, if they're not in your school already, they're certainly in your um, uh, your central office with your technology manager. And um, the English uh, teachers are going to be getting them soon. And you're going to get both about 10 just for you. So they don't belong to your department. <laughs> they don't belong to the cart. They're yours. They come with the course. If you're teaching this course, you get them. I base the numbers on this year. So if your numbers change a little bit, we might have to spread it out. So if there were, um, you know, if I sent you 32 because I thought you had, you know, that, in, I don't know, if I, I they, if I, if I sent you 40 because I thought you had four teachers and you really have five, we might have to, you know, share them out a little bit. Um, but they are four. They are meant to go with the course. So those are coming. And um, I, I hope that you find those useful um, for looking at collaborative learning with your students and to supplement the kind of technology that you might already have. So look for those over the next month or so. You can, it depends on your school. They may want you to save them till September. I know some of the schools got them and they started um, doing it now. Uh, the Mont en Marche, yeah. Um, Therese, I'm actually looking at, I put out a, a tender for um, periodical. So uh, I know that a lot of people use what in the world or the Mont en Marche, but um, yeah, it's in two levels in English and two levels in French. It's current affairs. I think it's a fantastic resource. Um, we actually, the province actually put out um, 
a, a call for bids and they're one of the bidders. So um, certainly order it for yourself, but you may see in the future that we might be able to get it for the whole province, which would be really awesome. I can't make any promises, but that would be one of the things I wanted to do. We ordered for French. Um, we did order you an, a couple of other magazine subscriptions, though, in the meantime. So I'm going to open it up to questions, and I'm sorry I, it was a lot of information to get out on the first day. I hope that um, in the other ones that you'll come back and we can dig into some of these um, things a little bit more. But um, yeah, is there anyone else who has any questions? I think I got all of your names. Yeah, I got it. 21 people, so I think that's everybody. Um, oh, I have a question. I would love to get the outcomes that you displayed. I will send those to you, James. When, as soon as I get back upstairs to my office, I'll send everybody. I got all your names, so as long as I can find you in GNS Pez, I'll send you an email. I will include this one, the professional learning plan, and I'll also include all the outcomes. And um, if you're not already in email correspondence with me, then here's how you find me. Ta -da. So uh, I love when teachers contact me. I love being able to help you. I will call you. I will come to your school. I will email you whenever you want. Just please ask me questions. Uh, and and you know if you have colleagues who weren't able to join us today who want to know more, then that's my whole job is to be available to you. So I'll just wait and see if there's any other questions. You're welcome, David. So thanks everyone. Um, it was great to see so many people interested and um, hopefully we'll see you and again uh, in a month. Um, but in the meantime, uh, definitely keep in contact with me by email and I will, tell, I will let you know uh, when things are coming to your school. Uh, and uh, everything that comes to your school will have a letter for your principal and a letter for you as to what it's for. So it should be great. So thanks very much. Have a great day.